So there are still a couple more accessories that I'm looking for, and I think 4x4 Megawold is probably the best place to come to find them. I'm here with Kurt Brunner from 4x4 Megawold and the first product I wanted to talk about was a bull bar for my discovery. So Kurt, tell me what's the main reason for putting a bull bar onto a vehicle? Honestly, you can take your disco now and drive to Egypt without a bull bar and you'll probably get there. These were originally designed by ARB as a roo bar, that's the nickname, that if you have an animal strike, a kangaroo, that your holiday doesn't stop. The Outback is a massive place, 40 k's an hour, you hit a kangaroo, radiator's gone, something's gone, your journey ends. So they developed it for frontal protection and then that grew into what we know as an off-road bar which then allows you to do the winch and the jacking points and so forth. Sure, and frontal protection is important when travelling in Africa as well, you've got donkeys, cattle, all that kind it's of stuff on the Australia. road, so <laughs> th there's your first benefit really. Yes. And um, one of the big questions I always get asked by my clients is, the airbags on their vehicle. When they put this thing on, are well, the airbags going to work? They're not going to work in that frontal impact uh, occasion. Yeah. ARB are the only guys that can show you video footage of where they write off a motor car. So there are brands out there that will say airbag compatibility. Can't show you a video, just a piece of paper. They write off every single 4x4 that gets produced to ensure the airbags work. Would you like to know how it works? I'd like to see the video. <laughs> <laughs> we can arrange that. In, inside the vehicle is a little device that works on inertia. It's got nothing to do with outside the vehicle. So what ARB engineers do is they get the crush rate from the engineers of the manufacturer and they duplicate the crush rate into the design. So this bull bar will move at a certain speed, a certain rate to allow the airbags to deploy at the right time. So then each bull bar here, so this one for the Toyota Hilux, is manufactured specifically to the Hilux's specification. Can't fit it to another car. Yeah. yeah. So could you tell me, why is this a winch bar? What are the characteristics that separate it from a normal bull bar? Well, if you see here, there is an aperture which is designed to accept the fair lead. If this were a non-winch bar, a bull bar, it wouldn't have the hole, the steel would just continue straight across. So the two bars are identical except for the hole. And I see this design here that AOB have got is, is quite a unique design for, for, for a bull bar. You do realize that a, a flat piece of steel is not very strong. If you put a bend in it, it becomes stronger. So what they did was they've now put four bends in it and they've increased the airflow. So very simple, but a very clever design and it was their brainchild. Airflow is another question that clients often ask me, you know, is it going to reflect, uh, restrict the airflow into the radiator? So, you know, they're going to have problems with that. But with this design, not going to have that problem. Well, this is the beauty of ARB. They make a bull bar, stick it on the vehicle, and drive the vehicle for thousands of Ks with special equipment, making sure that it doesn't overheat. Okay. Then another important kind of aspect of a, of a bull bar is your high left jacking points. So, I mean, are they built into the bar here? Right over there. You put the foot straight in, no adapter needed. You don't need a jacking point. You don't need to weld, you know, the little round circles on. Nothing. You just put it straight in there. Yeah, left or right. Okay. And then, so the one for my discovery, um, obviously also a winch bar. We can fit a winch onto there and spotlights. Mm -hmm. Done. Fits, fits like a glove. 100%. That's what I like to hear. Let's put one on. <laughs>
learn the, the safety aspects around operating your winch properly. Definitely have to learn how to use a winch. Most of it is common sense. Uh, there are a few tricks like you well know, but absolutely, um, we as salespeople do tell people the theory behind it. We don't show them the practical. They need to go to someone like you to actually physically do the job. Sure, sure. And submersing this thing in water, is it going to pick up any problems? Absolutely not. They are waterproof. The problem comes in in the electrical control box. So I always advise a client, open it up, spray Q20 or a silicon spray inside, because if it's going to stop working, that's where the problem's going to occur. This is the issue that most guys will encounter after doing a river crossing, is the connections go faulty. So you've got to keep this clean over here and inside by cleaning it with Q20 or any form of silicon spray to ensure that the water dissipates fast. Okay, and the water's not going to flow into that unit, is it pretty no, it can go in. No, the water can go in, it's not waterproof at all. What's important is that the winch is waterproof where the gearbox is and the motor. This can handle water. Good, I see we have uh, an alternative cable here that we can put onto this winch. What are the differences between the two? I think it boils down to application primarily. A guy at the coast who's pulling a boat on and off a trailer regularly, nice to have a synthetic rope because you can throw it, you can wind it up quickly, it's soft on your hands. Problem is, it's high maintenance. You must keep it dry and you must keep it clean. A farmer, for example, who might be pulling a tree stump once a month, a steel cable is great because once it's on the drum, you just leave it. You don't have to worry about it. One big advantage is weight. That is about 15 kilograms lighter once you take the steel off and replace it. What are the factors to take into account when selecting the correct winch for your specific vehicle? The weight of the car, uh, you can always go bigger than you need, smaller than you need, you're wasting your time. That's uh, our job again to advise a client. But a lot of guys don't realize that a winch isn't always that strong. Its strength differs as the layers get smaller. So again, our job to uh, teach them. Okay, and taking these numbers into account, what's kind of the rule of thumb with, let's use some um, vehicle examples? Uh, Weight-wise. Weight-wise. Um, I like to say if your car is two ton, then double it for your winch. Just rule of thumb, because you're not pulling two tons, you're normally stuck when you are using your winch. So there's resistance by mud or sand or an uphill or whatever it is. So again, we say to the guy, what's your weight of your car? In terms of extras, we do a quick calculation and yeah, we, we advise them correctly. And then another um, thing to take into account, which I've uh, picked up with using a winch in the past, is the amount of power that it draws from your battery when you're using it. Mm, big power. Yeah. yeah, over 200 amps at least. So it is advisable to have a second battery system that you can link the two batteries and use both of them to pull. Absolutely. Because yeah. you're going to be stuck pulling yourself out when you've got a flat battery. No, no, no. Doesn't work. No, then holiday's over. Yeah. And submersing this in your water? 100%. Right? Waterproof winch. Uh, again, if you are immersing the front of your car under the water, the winch isn't the issue, it's the electrical control box. My advice to any customer is every now and then open it up, spray Q20 inside, disperse, allow water to get out of the system. It is a maintenance um, a product, you can't just leave it. Okay, no, for sure. So now the correct winch for my Discovery 3, what are we going to look at there? I would go for a minimum of 11,000 pounds, so 12,500 pounds also do the job. Uh, remember, they always come in pounds. People walk in and say, oh, tons, not tons. Okay, so now that we covered the winch, I'm happy with everything here. Next thing I want to talk to you about is spotlights. Fantastic. Let's go and have a look. Okay. So good, spotlights, another bone of contention. Guys are always telling me I don't drive at night, which is advisable never to drive at night in Africa with all the animals and stuff on the road. But when you have to, it's good to have a set of these on your vehicle, am I right? Absolutely. Unfortunately, you can't always determine what's going to happen on your journey. So I always say to a customer, if you're driving in the daytime, do you close your eyes? Obviously you don't, you need to see where you're going. So good lighting at night, imperative. And now when it comes to selecting the correct spot for your application, I mean, mm. see there's different ones available, you've got the rectangular, you've got the round, different beams. Tell me, what are the options available out there? Well, distance between a round and a rectangular doesn't matter. They shine the, the, the same distance. It's what you like on your car. So, so it's I'm a cosmetic a, thing? Yes, I'm a fan. If you've got a round headlight, put on a round spotlight. If you've got a rectangular headlight, a rectangular spotlight matches nicely. Okay, so it's, it's basically down to cosmetics between the shape. Correct. Beam. Same no, thing. No, no difference. That's right. 
And then the difference here between the, the, the clear lens and this one over here? What? The clear lens gives you distance and the driving lens gives you spread. So we can offer you three options. We can give you two clear, two lensed, or one of each, which is very popular. So we put the clear on the driver's side for the penetration, and then we put the lens on the passenger side to give you the illumination on the side okay, of the road. So you've got a bit of width and... Correct. Okay, that's great. And some are waterproof, submersing these in water. Some lights are waterproof, some aren't. Um, it's important to make sure that the wiring is correct. Um, it is a serviceable item, irrespective of what brand you buy. You've got to open up your lights and ensure that, again, Q20 or silicon spray, because when they get hot and then they cool, you get condensation inside, you get water build up, you've got to service a spotlight. Yeah, because I often see after doing a water crossing, even the, mm. the headlights on the vehicle mm. start filling up That's the water right. a little bit. So. And uh, size does matter. Bigger, further. Okay. And globes? You know, I mean, can you change the globes? Are there uh, different specifications, you know, for...? Um, what's changing the field now is not the shape of the bulb, it's the gas in the bulb under a certain amount of pressure. So the guys are fiddling now with xenon gases up to 20 bar pressure and they're achieving brightness out of that versus more watts. So technology has improved, um, the guys are keeping up with the technology. This is a 100 watt light, fancy gas, under pressure in the bulb and it shines brighter than a 150 watt bulb. Okay. And obviously the big buzzword in the industry now is LED. Yes. We're a bit allergic to LEDs here. Um, an LED is a floodlight, it gives a lot of light close by. It is useless for high speed driving at night on the open road. Okay, so these are the ones we need to go Absolutely. for. Absolutely. And uh, for that bull bar of mine, what are you going to recommend you? Well, that's up to you. If you like the round, we'll do the round. If you like rectangular, we'll do rectangular. No okay. issue. Surprise me. I will do that. I'll okay. give you one of each. <laughs>now we're fitting all these accessories onto the vehicle which is obviously making the vehicle a lot heavier so one thing I would definitely recommend is fitting an off-road suspension system so good off-road suspensions obviously my vehicle can't take an aftermarket suspension it's got the air suspension but for the other guys out there why should they consider looking at something like this firstly let me say you don't have to change your suspension your car will work okay However, when you start taking a car beyond its GVM with accessories, the manufacturers never designed the shocks and springs to handle that type of permanent weight. So in steps Old Man Emu by ARB, these engineers buy every 4x4 that the market has got to offer, the popular ones. They then take it to the engineers and these guys then dissect the current uh, original suspension and they see what it does. They then add weight to the motor car and they then valve the shock and make the spring for that permanent weight. Then they increase it again and they remake the shock and the spring. And so the process goes. So when a client comes to us and they say they've got a particular car and they want a bull bar and a winch and a canopy and a draw system and a long range tank and the weight just keeps coming, we have the ability to give them a combination of shocks and springs that are designed to handle that vehicle. A spring carries weight and a shock absorber controls the weight. So then when driving off-road on a corrugated road, you're really going to see the benefits of something like this? Absolutely. Um, all shock absorbers, irrespective of brand, have got valves inside. The, the a number of valves and the volume of oil and the pressure of the oil are fundamentally important because that ultimately determines the quality of the ride. And tell me, Guys are always worried about lift, you know. Is a suspension like this going to lift the vehicle and give you more ground clearance? A shock absorber doesn't lift a vehicle. The spring, whether it's a coil, a torsion bar or a leaf spring, that's where you get the lift from. Oldman Emu is always within specification of the manufacturers. We never take a car out of spec. So the book will tell you it's a 30mm lift or a 50mm lift, that's it. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the springs a little bit. No problem. Yeah. So we've spoken about the shock absorbers over there. Why would we change the springs as well? Bearing in mind the spring carries the load of the vehicle. So if you're adding more permanent weight, you essentially need a stronger spring to hold the load. And you get a coil spring, a leaf spring and a torsion bar. Various manufacturers use a combination of those to, to put in between the, the chassis and the body. A coil spring is a very comfortable product. 
a leaf spring can take a load better, but a little bit harsher. And a torsion bar also can be a little bit harsh, but doesn't have nice travel like a coil spring and a leaf spring offer. Okay. So really another benefit of this is that wheel travel you're going to get, you know, especially when driving off-road. Absolutely, absolutely. A lot of guys don't want lift. Old Man Emu always offer lift, like I said, within spec of the manufacturers. Okay, and different, obviously different size springs for different vehicles, different weights, carrying abilities, that kind of thing? They are totally vehicle specific. You can't take one from a Mitsubishi and stick it in a Toyota. It just doesn't work. So once we've fitted one of these, what kind of road handling differences are you going to experience? Well, far superior to what you currently know. Because it is an integrated suspension, that means the engineers have designed the spring rate to be compatible to the valving in the said shock for that car. So although you get your lift, the road handling on tar, gravel and off-road at slow speeds is way superior to what the OE is designed to do. So really just to summarize, in the benefits of a suspension system is load carrying, road handling, wheel travel, and what have I missed? And comfort. And comfort. So then folks, you've heard it from the horse's mouth. The benefits are endless. Get one of these on your vehicle. If you're going to be doing any amount of traveling off-road, there are going to be times when you need to deflate your tires. Then when you get back to the tar road, you're going to need to pump them up again and there's not always a petrol station nearby. That's when carrying your own air compressor is very, very important. It's because one of the things I often see out there with my clients is when we get back to the tar road, it's time to pump up the tires again. The guy brings out this tiny little compressor that he bought at the hardware store. After pumping two tires, the things burnt out and packed up. So in my opinion, it's worth spending more on a heavy duty compressor. Would you, would you agree with that? For sure, there are many good brands out there. I think what sets the men apart from the boys is ARB can be fully repaired and serviced. There are spares available for everything. So if it packs up outside of its warranty, we can still fix it. And another plus point is it can handle the back pressure of a tire that's almost full very well. A lot of compressors have got a big delivery, but when, they, when the tire gets harder and the back pressure builds up, it just fades away. So see over here we've got the two different options, we've got the built-in one and the, the portable one over here. This, uh, this is obviously nice and neat and tidy, but can this be fitted into all vehicles? Because where, where would you fit something like this? Well unfortunately a lot of the new vehicles, that engine bay is so full of stuff, there's just no room to put it, so a guy has to take a portable one. And then the odd car, in fact there's a, there's a few vehicles that we can install them, them in front. I don't like an installed compressor, I like a loose one. You can walk down and help someone down the road, you can take it and pump a bicycle tire at home. I like a loose one. And the, um, the capacity, so comparison between the two, I mean, is this one stronger exactly than the, the or same. are they exactly the same? These two are exactly the same. There is a bigger one done by ARB. In fact, it's two compressors with a tank. That's insanely fast, okay. but uh, not necessary. Okay, so now obviously this thing needs to be powered by a car battery. So it's another thing drawing power from the vehicle. Uh, would you say that it's, to pump up four tyres, you need the vehicle to be running? Or is it safe to have the vehicle switched off while using your compressor? No, to pump four tyres, you don't have to start your engine. What you do need to look out for, though, is never buy a compressor that pumps into a cigarette lighter socket because the car's wiring is too thin to handle the current draw. Always look for crocodile clips. And I've seen it, it's normally the, the, the real light duty ones that come with a cigarette lighter one, but the, if you're looking out for a heavy duty one, like you say, the, that's what you want to be looking Absolutely. for. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so there you go. Benefits here is you'll be spending a little bit more, but in the long run you're going to be saving yourself money because it's going to last a lot longer. And you're going to save yourself time because you're going to, these things are going to pump up your tires a lot quicker than these uh, kind of light duty ones that you buy at the hardware store. So spend the money, buy yourself a decent air compressor, you're not going to regret it. So after a long, hot, dusty day driving out in the bush, nothing beats being able to sit by the campfire and open an ice cold beer. Long gone are those days of carting big cool boxes full of ice around with you, thanks to these products right here. So I'm going to go grab my mate Kurt, find out more about what he's got to offer you. So Kurt, I'm new to this whole off-roading 4x4 game. I've been using a cooler box for many, many years full of ice. Now I want to head off out into Africa. Ice isn't always available. Looking at a camping fridge. Sell me a fridge. 
It's an interesting conversation because the technology of a fridge doesn't really lie in the box or the switch per se. It's this thing, the compressor, that is the end all and be all of a particular fridge. So if you look at an Engel, it is the only fridge in the world that has got a swing motor. Sawa Fuji Japan realized 55 years ago that they needed to make a compressor that could work while being shaken and at different angles without affecting its lifespan or its ability to cool. So in essence, irrespective of what size angle you buy, that is what makes the fridge an angle, is this thing called a swing motor. I would buy a fridge, I wouldn't even hesitate not to buy one because having fresh milk, fresh food, cold beers, cool drinks, essential. No, for sure. And uh, we talk about the different sizes, like you said, family of four, mm -hmm. Obviously, they need quite a big fridge. Not necessarily. Uh, there's no right or wrong way of doing it. I always encourage a person, I say, how long is the holiday? How often is the holiday? And how many people on the holiday? A 40 liter Engel with a good cooler box, so don't throw the cooler box away, is a perfect combination. So you use this as a deep freeze and the cooler box as the fridge. Otherwise, you can get bigger. Space will ultimately determine what size you need to buy. For sure. And then we talk about fridge versus freezer. Because mm -hmm. I know like, a unit like this, it's either or. See, that's correct. So do these fridges come with the option of uh, a dual fridge freezer? So you can have the best of both worlds. You don't have to either have fridge or freezer. Engel do a 60 litre and an 80 litre combi with two, with two compartments. So that solved that problem. But you know what? With vacuum packing these days, you don't need to freeze meat anymore. I mean, well vacuum packed meat can last seven days in a fridge. For sure. And then on, on that combi unit, can you control the, the temperatures independently or is the freezer set at a certain temperature below what you set the, the fridge at? The Engel engineers have done a little trick there. They've got a, one cooling unit uh, run by the compressor in one half of the fridge and that is the deep freeze. And the other half of the fridge gets cooled via a little fan. So if you can imagine instead of cooling 80 litres with two knobs, you're now cooling half or freezing half and the little fan just sucks the cold air through. So it's quite energy efficient. Okay, yeah. So energy is another big factor when traveling out in the bush. Obviously, we've only got the batteries in our vehicle. What are the do's and don'ts to manage our power to keep this fridge running as long as possible? Most campsites these days have got electricity in South Africa. Once you start going across border, you're now entering a whole different world where there's no power. So if you do own a fridge, you're going to need another form of power dual battery system or a generator, solar power, a couple of variations. Okay, and let's talk a little bit about the current that a fridge like this will draw from the battery. You know, How, how long could you run a fridge like this before you really get into trouble with the, your battery power? How long is a piece of string? I say that because I don't know how hot it's going to be. I don't know how often you're going to open the fridge. And we also don't know, are you going to be putting in a room temperature cool drink to cool it down? But best case scenario, this fridge here will use about 1.8 amps to 2.5 amps per hour. So a good 105 amp deep cycle battery gets you four days on this fridge. Continu continuous yeah, running. Continuous. Okay. But like you said, the uh, thing you mentioned there about not putting warm or room temperature food into the fridge mm. at the start of your holiday. Rather, mm. cool it in the fridge at home, freeze the meat already, Correct. then stick it into the fridge. It's management. You, you, you can't take this fridge, switch it on, put warm food inside here and expect it all to be cold in two hours. It's not going to happen. Yes. Another important thing I would say is aftermarket service and the guarantees on these fridges. What, what do the Engels come with? They all come with a three-year guarantee which is held by us throughout Africa. And if you do have a, a problem with the fridge and you bring it to us and we right here will service it and repair it for you. So you service it on the, on the premises or you send it away? No, we do it ourselves. We've got all the equipment here. We've been trained by the Japanese in Japan. So uh, I think we can do the job pretty all right. No, that sounds great. And uh, tell me, which, which fridge would you recommend for me? I like the 40 litre for a couple of reasons. It's 24 kilograms empty. You'll have to help me. It can take a wine bottle standing up straight. It can take a two litre Coke standing up straight. However, saying that, you should never camp with bottles because they take up a lot of space even when there's a little bit left in them. You and I can carry this fridge, a woman can carry it. Uh, what a very popular uh, configuration is, is guys buy two. 
One is the deep freeze and one is the fridge. And you can carry it when it's full as well. Try and pick an 80 litre up when it's full. Doesn't work so nicely, no. No, I like the look of this. It's, it's neat and tidy. Mm. Doesn't take up too much space in the vehicle. Mm. Piece of useless information. It outsells all fridges in this country put together. No, I can believe it. Yeah. I can. So then, I wouldn't head out into the bush without one of these, so I'll definitely be taking one of these for myself. Well, oh, Kurt, I must say it's looking really great. So just walk me through what you guys have done here. Well, as you can see, we have removed the plastic front bumper. We've replaced it with the ARB winch bar. Inside, we've given you a winch with its control box. Nice set of spotlights, so you are ready to rock and roll. Ah, thank you very much. Excellent service. See you again soon. Absolute pleasure. Thanks. Cheers.